The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello and welcome to another Crashing Glass podcast. This is your co-host, Holly Hurley, back from China. And I'm here this week. It's just me and Jill. Hiya, Jill. Hiya, Holly. We're so glad to have you back. Well, thank you, and uh, because I've been traveling in China for the last two weeks, uh, Jill and I are actually going to talk a little bit about my trip in this week's uh, episode, which we are entitling uh, Chicks Going Abroad, <laughs> or maybe chicks even Chicks Abroad, abroad. <laughs> which is kind of funny because we're chicks and we're also broads, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're going to have to, when we, we'll have to definitely um, use title it so that you can tell that we got the word broads in there too. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Absolutely. <great. laughs> so uh so I guess I'll give a brief intro of the trip and then uh and then Jill you can ask me any questions you have and we'll try to cover a number of topics. I is that sound okay? That sounds perfect. I, I guess I just want to introduce it the the sort of the theme that we discussed, which is that you spent um a full 14 days, right, in China, or 14 plus the travel days? Well, I guess I guess in China probably 12, I think, maybe oh. with two travel days, something like right. that. Yeah. <sighs> and you, what, what we thought, the interesting perspective about your trip was learning about the role of women in China, and so to kind of encompass that when you tell us about your trip, and then maybe, and have some discussion about women's roles in, in China versus the U.S., and then also maybe versus other other places that we've been to or that we know about. Absolutely. Um, so while I was there, I went with the MBA program at WashU, um, which I found, you know, just riveting, quite frankly. I, uh, I definitely spent, uh, I mean, not enough time. Uh, this will be a very brief sort of overview, you know, of, of sort of the way that I found things when I was there. Uh -huh. I started uh, in Beijing. And Beijing is a, one of China's oldest cities. A lot of people actually say that if you're going to see ghosts in China, typically you see them in Beijing because it's a very old city. And while I was there, uh, China's Congress, the National People's Congress, was meeting. And I, was, uh, I began to notice a theme of them interviewing women on television. And then when I went to Hangzhou, I was actually in Hangzhou for Women's Day, International Women's Day, which we actually have here in America. But mm -hmm. there in China, women actually get an entire half day off. And of really? Course, Hanjo, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, being in Hanjo, we were trying to get massages because Hanjo is a very sort of more touristy. Um, it's a very cultural area. There are a lot of temples. There's the West Lake, which is a big deal in China. And, uh, and, and it was almost impossible to get a massage appointment because everyone was buying the women in their lives uh, massage appointments. Oh, okay. So it wasn't that the, the women masseuses were all off, although I bet a lot of them were. <laughs> Yeah, but it's probable actually. I didn't even think about that. And the working the, women, the working women were. That's what they were doing with their half day off. As they were going, they were pampering themselves. <laughs> well, I sure hope so. Uh, yeah, that's what it seemed to be. And then, uh, and then the last stop was Shanghai. And Shanghai is a very international city. I mean, being there, I compared it mostly to like a New York or perhaps you know one of the other large international cities in the world where everyone speaks many languages I met some girls some women who were working there who had been there for maybe five years and never had to learn Chinese because everyone they knew spoke multiple languages including English Wow! And, uh, so yeah so that was really crazy and I got to notice I got to speak to both Ford G and GM there in Shanghai and both of the women who spoke with us uh, were very successful and I uh, I found it very interesting. I learned a lot. So that's sort of the overview of the trip, and I guess that'll kind of guide our talk today. Yeah. Okay. So three major cities, but all all different types of cities. Beijing being the capital city, right? Which is why the Congress, the People's Congress, was meeting there when you were there. Yes, indeed. And, and then International Women's Day for this year, for 2012, was on March 8th. Uh, right, and that has I I know a little bit about it, even though it is not it, like you said, it's a sounds like a much bigger deal in China than it is here. 
but it does sell. They do have lots of events all over the world and uh, events for women to attend. It sounds like they also have some virtual things that you can do and um, online, you know, as well. But there's there's events and there's like it's just that this year's theme, which I had I didn't really know because I again it's not really well publicized over here as much. But the theme this year was connecting girls, inspiring futures. So I thought that was neat. So I don't know if you want to start with talking about how that went was when you were over there, because I assume you were in Beijing for that day. No, for National Women's Day, I was actually in Hangzhou. Oh, All that's there, right. I that's found they they began celebrating it and talking about it while I was in Beijing, and the sales and the things correlated with it. Uh, places like you know Meters Bonwell, which is a really international company, uh, the sales and the things that actually had like Happy Women's Day actually extended through the weekend, which I found really interesting. Wow. So that it becomes a it becomes an event like a, almost like with a commercial tie to it of marketing to women to to go out and spend money and of course and, yeah cool I mean nothing's <laughs> worth anything you know unless you can spend a little money I thought that was that was really really interesting so I mean the the first really uh, the the interesting thing uh, I think for me was being in Beijing first and foremost for the National People's Congress because that's the first city we were in. And, you know, while we were there, there were all these traffic jams and all the sort of things that you expect from that sort of environment. And we visited two companies. The first one was Rice and Coal and uh, Rice and Coal Chemicals, as they're known over there in China. And they basically, any, any sort of chemical that you use for any machinery that comes from coal, rice and coal makes there. And what the interesting thing, um, and this actually ends up affecting women as uh, Jill and I actually prepared for this week by reading some articles about uh, problems women face in China. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big ones is uh, some of the state-owned companies are treated much differently than independently owned companies. I don't know okay. if you noticed that, Jill, in, in your reading as well. I was sort of just focusing on like the gender discrimination and and that kind of thing more so than that. But so it's so it, a, um, a company that's privately a publicly owned, uh, a state owned is is treated with less esteem than a privately owned company. It's actually the opposite. The um, oh. private, uh, privately owned companies in China have to overcome some significant barriers. And Ryson's interesting. It was interesting because being at Ryson. They had, they had one woman who was the head of their marketing and strategy department speak to us, and all the other people who spoke to us were men. And I, I thought that was a coincidence at the time, and perhaps maybe it was. Um, but Rice and Coal is an independently owned company, although uh, their actual CEO wasn't with us that day because he is a member of the People's Congress. Oh, okay. And when asked how common that is, they said it's actually not neither common or uncommon. It just happens to be, you know. It's, it was interesting when you talk to people, both women and men in China who are high up in companies, they often say, like, when you ask them questions about government or government policy, they often say, whereas here, typically heads of companies complain, you know, oh, I pay too much taxes or, oh, the government's making it impossible for me. And it's mm -hmm. sort of the natural state of affairs that whatever the government's doing, businesses will think they could be doing better. Better. It's always right. There's always the, that, no matter who's in office. <laughs> exactly. Whereas in China, you would say something about the government and people would say, well, whatever the government says, we'll do it. You know, we'll adjust. Wow. And sort of, it wasn't like it, they weren't complaining. They weren't, they never would talk about like what sort of difficulties arose or like at the time that we were there, they were actually increasing, uh, they're increasing what you pay your employees. Hmm. And oh, we asked which is hard for the management. Yeah, what's that? Well, that makes it harder for the. I guess it gives the management some challenges to right. Is that what you know? That makes their job harder. Yes, especially because they're they're also being asked to cut a significant amount of cost. And you know, if you're a company that's expanding and growing, you they've had to lean out quite a bit and turn to a lot of new technologies. Especially because in this day and age, people are still having to build up the supply chains. In China, there aren't things like usable roads for most things or trains. It's actually very difficult for people to get things from place to place. So it's it's a high, it's a very high order, you know, to say you need to increase your employee payment by 20% this year, which was what the goal was for this year. And that comes down as a, oh, it's 20%. Right? Almost wow. unbelievable. 
And that's a mandate from the government. Correct. And the interesting thing about the Chinese government is, you know, one of the benefits of them being the kind of government they are, basically, when they send down an order, it's not, there aren't all these checks and balances like they are in our governments. There's nothing to really slow the momentum of these sorts of mandates. You know, basically, they make them and then they happen. Right. And well, no wonder why then that, you, like you said, I had the backwards that the private companies where it was, um, you know, you, you explained the private companies have it harder than the state, the state um, sponsored ones. So no wonder because they they have to if they're getting a mandate like that, and that's pretty tough to meet your bottom line when you're when you got a twenty percent hike just overnight. Yes, right. yes, yeah. it was. And that was one thing we talked about a lot with Rice and Cole. And the way this plays into, you know, women's rights is that, you know, a lot of the articles I've read since coming home suggest that a lot of women actually, regardless of what their dream is for their life, turn to working for government companies because the health insurance is so much better and the coverage for them is so much more consistent. Okay. And obviously, these these rules about hiring that are so that the government's so strict about are especially very clear. Uh, I don't have any specific examples on that, but with the with the government, so there's less of sort of the unfair treatment for women within government-owned companies because they have the resources to treat them fairly. Right. So that's yeah, that seems pretty clear cut. If you're a woman looking to you know to kind of get a good job and move up the ladder a little bit. In a, in a company and, and stay there, if you've got the health insurance that will, is not going to be in question. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and I think that was a big part of the reason why women end up working there. I also, I also found it really interesting when the Congress was meeting, um, and Jill, I think you and I got a chance to talk about this. You know, the, the American Congress actually had uh, some, of the, some of the numbers wrong. I only have the number actually on the Senate uh, here in the states, you know, the Senate out of let's see how many people are in the Senate. One hundred. One hundred. Uh, we have about seventeen percent because seventeen of our Senate members are women here in okay. the states, or at least were up through two thousand ten. That's what. Oh, so uh, one of them. One of them just announced her retirement. My favorite senator of all time, which is Olympia Snow of Maine. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and she's a moderate. She's one of the last moderates still there. Uh, and she's reti- she's not going to run again, and it's it it kind of broke my heart a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, so hopefully it won't go down to sixteen. But um, after the elections, but so seventeen us uh, out of a hundred senators here. Are Correct. Women. And then when you look at the uh, the People's Congress, you know, uh, here in America we often think that Chinese or that China we still have this sort of antiquated idea that China is very behind on social issues. But mm-hmm. their, their Congress is 20% women, and in the past five years, that's actually down a percent from, uh, from the years before. I mean, it's, it's been around 20 to 21% for many, many years. They have basically uh, done a little bit better than us, if you will, for a number of years by having, uh, by having a, large, a large percentage women in their Congress. And I thought it was fascinating to watch to watch this unfold on television and to be near. We were actually went to Tiananmen Square while they were doing all the voting. And you see all of these prominent women officials, you know, speaking on television and speaking in in this format. And it just really drove home to me that China is actually a place where most Asian countries we think of as being sort of um, male dominated. But China, I think, would be an exception. Well, I'm so glad to know that. It's encouraging. <laughs> it's encouraging because it does, you do think of, you know, certainly the Middle East and, and also the, you know, a lot of the countries in, in, I guess, Far East and Southeast Asia, you definitely don't think of them as being socially progressive. Uh, so it's great to hear that Chinese women are doing so well and surprisingly, surprisingly well from what we thought, you know, from what our probably our perspective is over here. That's great. No, I would I would definitely agree with that. And I, I found it especially interesting, you know, moving away a little bit from politics, uh, that women there also in the, the media, obviously not speaking the language, it was uh, very difficult for me, you know, to find uh, television shows and things like that I could watch. Right. <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> but I did, you know, I definitely attempted to take in some of the culture that was there and actually enjoy some of the television shows that they had. And I saw one where there were two female cadets in the military. 
uh-huh. uh, who were in charge of a unit who, who you know, you basically get to see their daily lives and exploit. There are a lot of militant kind of shows going oh, back. Oh, Now, was this a, was this a, this was not documentary style. This was an, just a, a fictional TV show? Correct, yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I thought it was it was fascinating. A lot of the TV shows have women in boss positions or women in warrior positions. Or, you know, I mean, we think obviously in this country of crouching tiger, hidden dragon almost all the time, you know. But yeah. this is a... <laughs> I mean, that's... I, I don't even... I don't remember what year that, that was set in that movie. But, you know, yeah, we do. We, I think we think of China as that, like, really traditional and that the old... The old China. <laughs> Right. Exactly. You saw, yeah, you saw you saw so much of the new China, um, and it must have been just so funny to try to take in the TV shows where you you didn't literally didn't know. It's not like trying to watch a TV show in French or Spanish or you know even German maybe where you can catch a couple words. I'm assuming that it you know given the pace of which they're speaking and it must have been so hard. <laughs> To follow any of the words, but you were able to get the gist of the fact that women were, like there was there was a there was a show about two women cadets in the military. That's pretty cool. It was. It was pretty cool. And my favorite movie that I saw while while I was over there actually was showing with English subtitles, mm-hmm. and it was called Speed Angels. Yeah. And it, it's I looked about it up. The, yeah. Oh yeah, you did. You looked it up. I did. So it's about female race car drivers, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so cool. And and the, it's it's like the Danica Patrick of China. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, this was a this was a couple of years ago. I think. Well, actually, I think it was released like last year. So it's actually a pretty new movie. But it was awesome. You know, there's this whole racing team made of females, and and it it's interesting because the premise is, you know, essentially you have one of the girls catches her husband cheating with some other girl, and then eventually, basically by the end of the movie, they're like, we have to overcome this. Because we're race car drivers first and foremost, and we we can't afford to be petty and be involved in silly things like this. And I just thought it was really it was a really innovative film because they were the talent, they were the race car drivers, they were the you know, pardon my language for lack of a better word, they were the badasses. Yeah, they were the protagonists. Well, when you read that quick, I mean, I'd love to watch it. It it looks like a fascinating film. It sounds like there was all the like the personal lives drama that worked was getting in the way of like you said what they what they wanted to what they wanted to focus on which is their their you know their racing and their and so it, and there's all this other stuff going on <laughs> uh drama all around them that they had to block out or they had to overcome yeah it definitely was and i thought it was fascinating to sort of see women overcoming that and being in a position of power and and then, you know, that juxtaposed against having the Congress, you know, having the Congress meeting and 20 percent of them being women or over 20 percent, I think, this year, you know, and the people that were speaking had been members of the Congress, some of them for, you know, 20 years. Wow. So you're talking long standing female Congress members. And I, I just found it very encouraging. And I think sort of the direction that China's going is very impressive. And I definitely um uh, you know, moving on, I guess, a bit to my time in Shanghai, which, as I said, is a very international city, I noticed that a lot of the ad campaigns mm-hmm. that were geared towards women were very, none of this, it wasn't all just, you know, bras, underwear, makeup, although obviously there was a lot of that, beautiful faces, those sort of things. It was also tough women going to work, Rosie the Riveter kind of views, you know. <laughs> yeah. Going to work in um, white collar and blue collar jobs. Absolutely. Um, Rosie the Riveter was sort of that blue collar, right? Exactly. And they were like women. There was this one fantastic ad campaign with like 10 women all dressed in jumpsuits, basically looking like they were going to a construction site, you know, holding a hard hat. That is wild because you wouldn't see an ad. You would not see that in advertising here unless they were, you just wouldn't see it. Unless they were like the women were about, I feel like unless they're about to like wear, wearing those um, basketball warm up style j- jumpsuits where they just <laughs> rip them open and they're wearing like sexy lingerie underneath. I agree. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a shortcoming in a way because that's something 
not that I, you know, would agree wholeheartedly with, I think this is a limitation we put on ourselves here in the States, but I thought it was very impressive. Yeah. Just really so, neat. Oh, go ahead. I, it's, there's so much. I, I yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm fascinated with, with cultures and the differences in culture, you know, in other countries versus ours. So, um, yeah, this is great. I, I have a, but I want to back up to the, um, is it called the National People's Congress? Is that what they call when Congress, their Congress meets? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay, just for a minute, I guess my first question is how, uh, well, my first question is, are the women appointed, or the, or I should say the women and the men, are they appointed or are they elected in any way? Because um, I'm assuming that the leaders, the, the leaders that the higher up are, are not elected, they are, they are communist appointees, right? But the Congress itself, is that an elected position? Well, it's uh, the, a large part of the membership apparently is still determined by the Communist Party of China, but okay. it's moved away a little bit from its role as a symbolic but sort of powerless legislature, and it's actually become a forum where people can share through their appointee their feelings, and it basically has become much more, they've given much more power to their con constituents. Uh, one of the uh, members recently of the MPC, who is a woman, uh, Hu Zhaoyan, actually says that she isn't, she said that as a parliamentary representative, she doesn't feel like she has any real power, but that her ultimate goal is to be able to help her constituents. So we're, they're not quite there yet as far as actually giving power to the people. Mm -hmm. But it is, uh, but but especially the Congress are definitely working towards becoming a better voice for the people. Even though they're listening to what the party's telling them, they also want to make sure that it's being communicated well and that the people in the country are actually being heard to a certain Advocate, extent. Yeah, advocating for their constituents. Yeah, okay, interesting. Even if they don't necessarily yet have the power to really change things for their constituents, which is some of the frustration, actually, I heard from... Uh, some of the women uh, executives that I spoke to who are very high up in the companies that are there, especially the ones that came over from other countries like the United States or Germany, they found that uh, their frustration a lot was with the government limitations because every decision any company makes goes through, they have a liaison with the government and it goes through their government liaison and essentially if the government decides that that's not within where the country wants to go as a whole, Whatever the product is, whatever the advertising campaign go is, whatever the whatever the decision for the company is, whatever investment decision, whatever supply chain decision, they won't be allowed to do it. If okay. if the Congress or you know if the if basically if the Communist Party says no, that's not going to work for China, then they're not allowed to do it. Okay. Wow. So it's it is still that mentality. Yeah. So well, ironically, that it's called the People's. Um, the People's Congress, <laughs> or the <laughs> National People's Congress. It is, I find that so funny that, you know, just that with communism, it's this, it's, it's as if the people have, you know, I mean, that seems to be the same way when, when Russia was communist, and that it's all about helping the people, when, which, when really they're taking the power away, there's no democracy, right? So I think that's, I've always found that ironic. <laughs> So, Holly, how often d does this Congress meet? And I imagine that these these congressmen and women are traveling from, some of them, from very remote areas to get to Beijing. And I'm sure it's not like here where they can hop on a plane and get to, you know, Washington, D.C. to, for the, you know, for within a couple hours or half a day. I mean, I imagine it's quite a journey for some of them. It is, and it's actually interesting because they meet about every... A year. They meet every year for two weeks. Oh, okay. That's all. That's the only, it's just two weeks out of the year that they actually are face to face with each other. So, yeah, it's a little different from our Congress. They don't have to move up to D.C. for the whole four years. They're there, you know, for a large portion of it. You know, they're not meeting throughout the year. But that during those two weeks, I mean, a lot gets done. I mean, for instance, while I was there, they made a decree that they were going to increase military spending by 11 percent of the or military spending was going to be 11 percent of their budget surplus this year, which is they were just going to take 11 percent of their budget surplus and put it all towards the military. Wow. Um, and that's, that's a big decision to be made two weeks once a year, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Huh. Well, it's, it, you know, I think of the other interesting thing about it is that China is often viewed now 
a, such a competitor of ours. So to hear it for one that the fact that you guys were allowed to have so much access around I'm I'm sorry I get that's progress in itself just that they allow people from the outside to come in and learn and because it is they are our economic competitor in such a big way and a lot of people feel like you know the threats to the US are not so much yes there's still the whole terrorist threat and the idea of you know different groups of you know factions that are want to plot against us and you know then the whole the whole post 911 world but that china is truly our greatest threat to you know to our economic our economic success in the future here in the united states that's actually a really interesting question jill it sort of depends on what research you read um, i am not a fully professional on the difference between the American economy and how indebted we are to China and all that sort of things. You'd really want to talk to a professional economist about okay. something like that. But there are some very pervasive feelings in a lot of companies see a lot of growth in China and they're projecting large amounts of growth in the middle class. Now, there's, for instance, the professor that traveled with us, Professor David Myers, who believes that China's poverty levels are still very large and are going to continue to be very large, thus making them, as far as uh, sort of cost effectiveness of their consumers, is going to be significantly, still be significantly weaker than the U.S. I see. Um, there's still a lot of growth there because you're talking about a country that is, I mean, billions of people large and comparatively to the United States, even a small portion of their population is a large portion of ours. So right. just population wise, they, they, they do have a lot of people, but as far as consumption is concerned, many of those people are still impoverished and the government doesn't seem to be making huge moves to fix that, which actually I think limits them on an international scale in some ways. They're they still don't have a middle, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're still also relatively rural, which would make it very different, difficult outside of they have they have tiers for their cities and Beijing, Shanghai, and Hangzhou, the cities where I was in, are first tier cities. But their cities go all the way down to tier six cities, and some of those tier six cities they can't even figure out how to get electricity and water to yet, wow. much less get like a viable supply chain going. And so there are some reasons why I think America has been slow to talk about the indebtedness to China and the issues with China because I think right now they're not necessarily at a place where they could really bring, even though they have millions and billions more people than we do, really bring that together into anything really truly to the level of an America. Mm -hmm. To an economic success that will keep on, for that you know, that we've had proven for hundreds of years now. I, I guess I'm wondering about the middle. They don't have a middle class, really, and they, like you said, they there's there's so many impoverished people that they don't. Those people don't have money to put into the Chinese economy, you know, like like we do here, where people are buying, you know, just like sometimes they say, well, let's if we're giving a tax rebate, let's say that'll cause people to put money. They'll go out and buy TVs. They'll go out and buy furniture. They'll go out and buy cars and put money back into our economy to get jump started again. Well, the Chinese don't have that they don't have that ability I bet actually what's interesting um, they don't but they are growing very quickly um, I don't have the projections on hand but I mean hand over fist almost near I mean the other middle classes and the others quote-unquote established portions of the world are growing less than say 10 percent a year whereas china is currently growing much much more than that you know a lot closer to 20 percent depending on whose projections you read every year so china's middle class is definitely on the grow and no doubt with so many billions of people that's a large percentage of growth and there definitely is economic wealth to be found there uh, for certain companies that are forward thinking and ready to make that move but there are difficulties that come with that. As I mentioned, there are gaps in the supply chain over where these less developed areas are. It's difficult to get things from one portion or one established city to the other. People are still doing things like traveling by ship one way, by train one way, and then in between they have to have warehouses to keep things. And, you know, Yum China has had a lot of success there, an American company, with building their presence over there. But 
there is there are some difficulties. Now that said, being a communist government, one thing that some people do believe about China is that they hold a large amount of reserves, and at any given time, they don't really have to worry about a recession in quite the same way that the developed sort of de democratic countries do, because right. they can hold money aside and sort of throw and then sort of throw money at problems as they see fit. Yeah, and there's no checks and balances for that either. So okay. that that I could see makes them very scary to a more established people people's government, you know, where the government actually has to go back to the people. Right, right. But, yeah, and, and right and get permission or or their the, our government is held accountable by us. And it's so interesting to think about capitalism. It's so interesting for me to think about you know, that we have democracy and, and capitalism, and they're sort of, we've got them hand in hand here, and clearly we feel that it's a successful recipe <laughs> for a successful country. Now, for them, they, they, they have the capitalism for, you know, the bulk, or for, like you said, the, their middle class is growing by leaps and bounds, but they don't have the democracy. So it's, it seems like in the short term, that, that because they can put all those reserves aside, that they won't, they, they're right, they're not going to have a major recession because they can just pump that stuff right right out. They have these reserves and they can kind of do what they want versus, you know, we, we have the checks and balances of capitalism here. So I, I'm certainly far from an, eco, <laughs> an economist, <laughs> but I it is it is fascinating to think about the, the differences and just, how, and whether it's, it's a long-term it's long term successful because obviously the USSR, the you know the Soviet Union was did not end up being successful in the long term. It didn't work. But China's been. Do you know how long that China's been communist? I I don't know the answer to that. Do you? Well, they had a standing. Actually, let me just look up my details here because they had one of the lasting. Uh, you know what? I'll just Wikipedia it before yeah, I talk Wikipedia. to you. Well, and I can ask you while you're doing that. I, I just I'll make a quick comment that in the in the articles that we did read, you know, the research to prepare for today, um, it was interesting to hear. Uh, this is kind of jumping to more social issues rather than economic. But the women um, are traditionally in charge of the family finances, and so a lot of the women that are housewives, you know, if they are home and they've been, they're raising their kids. They're the ones in charge of the money. They invest their family, the money, uh, you know, their family's money in real estate or stocks, um, or I guess they can also invest in private firms. And that, you know, that it's just interesting that that's their part of their job, you know, at home or at, at whether they're working, working women or if they're house Chinese housewives that they do the family finances. Yes. So, so basically, the the government as it exists now has existed this way since about 1954. Okay. Um, with some significant changes being made in 1975, and then again in 1982, and some amendments as recently as like 2004. But uh, before that, they actually did have a, con a consultative conference, which was very similar to sort of the NPC as we know it today, the National People's Conference, um, which it was similar, but they had sort of, it was really more just, not to say a front, but it was uh, more... I'm trying to think of the word that I can say. It was really just supposed to be sort of a representative of a broad range of people, and obviously not terribly effective in that way. And, you know, China had a dynasty that lasted uh, well into the 19th, 20th, you know, I think 19th century, exactly. Let me see here. I'm not yeah, about. well, so you're saying that the, the communist leader, the party now has been in power since about, the, about the 1950s. Yeah, exactly. So he, so Mao Zedong basically founded the the People's Republic of China in 1949, uh, and that was at, and he was a follower of Marxism and Leninism, mm -hmm. and he basically overthrew things as we Chiang Kai Shek, as you remember, in the Chinese right. Civil War in that time. Right. So anyway, I didn't mean for this to get into Chinese historical thing or any sort of economic policy. Although I know we had a list. <laughs> very similar to the one that you had. Um, I'm not obviously qualified to speak on those things but after my two-week trip, but I definitely noticed a difference in sort of working women and also the women, you know, women in media while I was there. And definitely within the companies I got to meet, 
you know, we met with uh, GM Shanghai, and we also met with Ford in Shanghai, and we met with IBC, ICBC, which is the Chinese bank, and all three of those meetings occurred with very high-ranking women officials, whether it was a CMO or a special projects manager or an acting VP, all of them, and even at Rice and Coal, you know, the, the vice president of strategy was a female. And so even in some of the more established companies in China, in even the older cities like Beijing, you see a large portion of, you know, Chinese women stepping up to the forefront, which I, I found interesting because a lot of the research says that women are still struggling there. But it seems it's more commensurate with what we have here and less commensurate with what you would think of in a developing company. Right. A developing country, yeah. No, it, it's such a, it's very eye-opening. I'm so glad that you know not we, you were able to go. I'm glad I'm glad for you to have that experience, uh, and then also to share it with us because I, and I feel like when you do discuss uh, a country in the present, you do have to kind of relate back to its history um, because it is you need that perspective of okay, so we know it's a communist, but how long has it how long has it been that way? And so we now we know it's what about. 60 years or so that this this Communist Party has been ruling and in, in, in control. Um, so, but jumping back to a little bit more about working women, because I know that's kind of what we wanted to focus on too, is that interesting that some of the some of the stuff I read about women and discrimination in the workplace, just that, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously there, you know, it's the same, a lot of the same complaints that we hear, have heard here, maybe going back a little bit 70s or you know 60s 70s when when the women here were you know going back going into the workforce and um bigger numbers uh than the than now it's sort of more expected but well i think holly i know we want to talk a lot about you know focus on work women and working women in china but i think it's nice to have the perspective of if you're talking about a country and its culture to have the the perspective of What's the economic climate like there, as well as what's the history? And and it, it's I think it's good to know that the Communist Party has been in rule for since you know like you said 54, and that's about it's going back about 60 years. Um, and I just wanted to make one comment about some of the reading I did about discrimination in the workplace, and the fact that there's a lot of looks discrimination in China. Now, granted, there's a lot of looks discrimination in the United States, for, clearly, but it was interesting how this this research was done and that women that are tall and attractive tend to have many more doors open for them than the shorter ones in China, which I would think that if you're a very tall Chinese woman, you, def woman, you definitely stand out more because there's probably less less overall average height, you know, than, than here. But I also thought it was interesting that um, that there's a couple interesting expressions. One of them is uh, the word, a Chinese idiom that they use called flower vases. So the word, uh, the expression oh, yeah. flower vases is a Chinese idiom for women who are decorative but of little use. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. And then also that there was a time that, the provincial government of um, Hunan, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but for there was a time, I mean, this is in recent times, that the prevent, that their government, their local government, required that women who are working in public service, they called them civil servants, they had to have symmetrical breasts. That was actually in the writing, and that, that requirement was dropped in 2004 after it was widely ridiculed. <laughs> You know, it, yes, okay, that's like the, I read that too, and I think that's like the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. What's so fascinating about it, though, is there, yes, looks discrimination in China, I think the big difference is here, we don't admit to it or we call it something else. Right, that's what I was thinking. We have it here, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, well, you see the same sort of statistics on men and women in the workplace here. If you look at uh, men's workplace statistics in China, men who are tall and have deeper voices actually tend to make, earn more money over their life. Statistically, here or in China or both? Both. 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 But, it, but specifically, we read that and we were actually told that by one of the companies we worked with in China. Um, but what's interesting is that in China... For instance, I went into a department store, and it's not unusual for someone to say, "No, no, you're too big. You're mm -hmm. too big for that outfit. Mm -hmm. You're you're too big, or you're too fat, or 
I heard someone say in China to another woman something to the effect of, yeah, you know, I don't like your haircut or you, you, you look bad in that dress. Like things, things like that are more common for in the workplace. To say. Oh, in, oh, in work the workplace, in the workplace. Yes. I, well, I was speaking generally, obviously. Oh, but oh they're much back, more blunt. Yes. Much more blunt in general. And so what I feel is interesting is that I definitely, according to the article we read, what I really found interesting, um, and the source for, we, we read a couple articles, but the source for the one that we read was on factsanddetails.com, but it sourced an article by a lady by the name of D.D. Kirsten Tatlow, and this was in the New York Times, uh, November 25th to 2010, to cite our resources here. Mm-hmm. Um, but she actually mentioned that they actually asked the question in an interview of when do you intend to have a baby? Yes, that's right. That's an interview question for a job interview for women. Yeah. Which is interesting because here, you know, I went to a negotiations course by a a successful professor at my school by the name of Judy McLean Parks. And Judy has, has worked with different gender differences in negotiation, both here. She's worked in the UAE. She's worked in a lot of countries where this is a difficult issue. And one of the things she said was here in America, we actually do, the women are judged by their resume. If there's a gap in the resume of a married woman, the employer will assume that woman has already had her children, believe it or not. Right. Whereas if, uh, if, there's, a, if there's a gap in a man's resume, they'll assume that that man uh, is irresponsible. Okay. Oh, that's so wild. That's paper, what, that's- as far as our resume is concerned, but it also can work against you once you get into the position because your employer, though they never said it, will have assumed that you were not going to leave them to have a baby. Right. They would be mad. They, they'll they, just ask you. <laughs> yeah. yeah they, it, you're right. It said that's the last question that the boss would ask during an interview is, I see you just got married. When will you have a baby? And she said, I guess her answer was, you know, she tried to say, I'd say not for five years at least, but they don't always believe you <laughs> when you answer that way. Wow. So... That's really wild. So the gap, the gap in the resume, is doesn't hurt the women because it's assuming that they were bearing children and then home with their small children for a period of time. It, and it's a very strange assumption. Uh, but here, as I say, these things are assumed and dealt with accordingly. For instance, you know, one of the things that we've talked about on the show before is a lot of employers. One of the reason they're often hesitant to hire young married women is they assume that woman is going to have a baby and there's a very small chance because statistically something like only 20% of women who have children actually return to work after their maternity leave. Right. So That's they're required the yeah. to leave that job open and hold the position. But So here they, they think about these things and they make these decisions based on these things but they don't talk about it. Right. Whereas in China because the laws are very lax they're allowed to actually just say when are you going to have your baby? <laughs> we need to know. Yeah, that's so wild. You're right. It is assumed here. And it, and it comes to, I know, speaking both from my father, who was on us, the local school committee in my hometown for a long time. And that would come into play when, you know, with women te- hiring young teachers. Because they were like, we're just going to, are we going to just have to do this again in 18 months or two years? If, you know, a teacher just had just gotten married, a female teacher. And I remember rolling my eyes thinking, oh, well, that's their prerogative. If they, you know, what are you going to do? We're going to stop having babies so that no one has to like, do any extra work and fill a position again. You know, we're, we'll just, we'll just let the, the, um, whatever you could call it, the progeny of the race just drop off, you know. <laughs> yep. But anyway, I, and then, you know, I know the same, it happens in hiring all the time, that you know, whether, how long someone will stay if they are. So so in China, they can, they can just speak bluntly and ask those questions, and that's wild. Well, interesting about what you heard about someone saying about that they're, that outfit, was they were too big for it or whatever, because when I went to Japan, which, you know, a very different place, but just given that it was another Asian country and um, maybe has some similarities, and when I went to the nice department store, you know, the Macy's-style store to buy, I wanted to buy myself an out in a skirt or something in, in Tokyo, um, I could barely fit into the, like, ex- to the extra large. <laughs> yes, and, it was wild because I, I was like, wow, uh, very different from U.S. sizes. <laughs> 
Yes, I I think that that was a big thing for me as well. And of course, I was trying to buy. I was trying, but in all fairness, I was trying to buy things for my husband as well, and they didn't have anything that would fit him. I mean, even the double extra large, we can't even. He's going to have to wear it once, and we can't even wash it, you know. But it, it's a very, it's a very different culture as far as that's concerned. As you said, very straightforward. They're like, no, no, you're an extra large, and you think, oh my god, I can't possibly be an extra large. I'm a <laughs> normal the- size woman. Yeah, that's funny. Well, I have, as we wrap up, Holly, I just had this great quote that I read, again, on this same, it's the New York Times article um, that um, a, um, a magazine columnist from from China was interviewed and by the New York Times, and, and this was, so she was a working uh, Chinese woman, and her quote was, you know, the main issue, this is fr- from a, a woman who is, you know, kind of starting out and trying to figure out her, her career, she says, the main issue we face is confusion about who we are and what we should be. Should I, for instance, should I be a strong woman and make money and have a career, maybe get, grow rich from that, but risk not finding a husband or having a child? Or should I marry and be a stay-at-home housewife and support my husband and educate my child? So there's those two sides, and I thought it interesting that she wrote and educate my child. I mean, she said educate my child because versus we would probably say our, my our, my children because they can only have one, right? That's still mandated from the government. Is that, that true? Was, no, that is true. And it was interesting because I went to a chopstick store. And there was this cute little set that had, like, a mommy one and a daddy one and then a baby one. And I thought, well, what about kids that have more than one? And then I went, oh, oh. <laughs> that doesn't happen here. No. Yeah, that's that's wild in itself. Hmm. Well, it was really interesting. And obviously, I know we need to wrap up, Jill, but it was really interesting to talk to some of these executives who are marketing products. Because especially in the car industry, we talked at both GM and Ford about this. They said, you know, Chinese don't typically drive themselves. And when you're talking about a family with a child, a lot of times they want a bigger car so that the three of them can sit comfortably in the back. And you think when you're marketing, say, a minivan in the United States, we market them to young families. Right. Here in China, occasionally that happens, or there in China, occasionally that happens because they will have a driver. But for the most part, Minivans are marketed to business people who need to get other business people places because uh-huh. the families are so small. Yeah. Why would they need a minivan? Right, there's only three of them. You know, right? There will only be three family members, right? <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine uh, as a mother? You know, oh, only one. Yeah, and that's it. And yeah, interesting. Well, I thought that was a neat quote because it. I mean, we and that's that is showing me. I guess maybe similarities to here because I mean. Uh, United uh, U.S. women, American women face that same thing. Oh well, you know, should I should I put off having children, put off being married, and just focus on my career? For us, it's not so much whether we have a career; it's just how long our career goes before we say, "Well, am I going to pull back and go part time or change it because I'm going to start my family?" So it's not like for us, we don't have to have either or. And maybe this is a nice way to sort of segue into a, one of our future shows that when we talk more internet about with international women about, you know, inter, international women's issues. But we don't have to decide, oh, am I going to have a career or am I going to have a husband and a child? Um, we can have both. It's just how do we balance it and how do we time it and and how does it all? Yeah. How do we figure it out? And I also loved the the correlation, Jill, that we talk about so often between the guilt that women associate with working or staying at home and Mm -hmm. that either direction, you know, even women in China feel that same guilt Uh, about either staying home and educating their children or not. You know, they they feel the same guilt we feel here. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure guilt guilt is a universal emotion. And I think women have more than their share. (laughs) Indeed, ma'am. Yep. So, well, oh, Holly, this is just fascinating. Like, I love it. I could do that. I could do, talk about this all night. Um, I really like hearing about, you know, other cultures and about in a woman's place and other cultures. And so we'll have to, um, we'll put this on our docket for um, for the future to do more. I talk about international, you know, women and cultures and, 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 and where they, and the differences and the similarities to, to America. 
Well, and if you're listening to this at home right now and you're really wanting to add to this topic or perhaps give us some suggestions for future guests um, or anything that you'd like to know about it, please go to BaseNetTV.com or email us at CrashingGlass at BaseNetTV.com and we'd be happy to talk about it on the air. We, we love to hear from our viewers and we always appreciate your insights. So thanks again and I guess... Jill, if, if that's all you have, that'll be this week's Crashing Glass podcast. No, that's all I have. Just any from listeners that we have, we would love some. We would love to hear input and any comments and questions. So, what a, it was a great topic, and uh, we'll be back next week. Bye bye.